You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Although Hidden Traps is not officially released until August 1st, you can pre-order your paperback or ebook copy now from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit BlackWolfPublications.com for more details. Here's George Foreman with InventHelp. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. Call InventHelp today for free information. InventHelp has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. InventHelp can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call InventHelp today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee a company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put InventHelp in your corner. To get your free inventor's information, call 1-800-353-6490. That's 1-800-353-6490. Again, 1-800-353-6490. This is Rio of Madison Rising, and you're listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. It's time now for the Conservative Curmudgeon Radio Show. Now, here's Grouchy. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. It's been two weeks since I was with you last. Thank you for tuning back in. Uh, My summer hours are hectic, as they are every year. Uh, we're going to we're going to have to do one more week where we skip a show next week and then we're going to be back live. I uh, got a good good guest with a great topic lined up for you on August the 9th. So be sure you tune in for that. Um, tonight, you just listened to Polita Bunny on FUBAR. At least you should have, because if not, you've been wasting your time. Uh, you get me now, then you get Jesse's POV, and then tonight, tonight we're going to welcome the Stafford voice on to Wednesday night's lineup um, in a very special time slot for Daniel Stafford. So be sure to stay tuned and welcome him, and you'll actually get your knowledge on again with Daniel. And then after that, America off the rails to be your nightcap. So do yourself a favor. Wednesday TV sucks. Just stay right here on KLRN Radio all night long. It really is the best place to be anyway. Now, before we um, get into everything that I had prepared for tonight's show, we got to break down a little bit of what went down today. Okay? Uh, You may already catch what I'm talking about here, but, um, you know, our president made the comment that transgender folks uh, are no longer going to be allowed to serve in our military. And immediately the popping sounds were being heard across the country. Those were liberals' heads exploding. Um, 
it you know because the knee jerk reaction of course is to feign outrage when they don't even know anything about anything other than the words that were in a tweet 140 characters so first of all let me not get into um what people expect or think are their rights let's let's dodge all that let's dodge all the well you hate transgender people let's dodge all that and go right down to the nitty-gritty here okay i was a medic in the military i served for 10 years desert storm veteran um here's what i know about medical resources and the availability of such in the military military members regardless of age sex religion creed and now sexuality are not entitled to cosmetic procedures the military does not perform elective procedures just because you want it done the military performs surgery to repair something that is broken and if they cannot completely repair it they do the best they can discharge you from the military and retire you medically now here's what doesn't qualify as necessary surgery nose jobs boob jobs uh, switching a penis to a fake vagina or switching a vagina to a fake penis it doesn't matter it's all cosmetic surgery they're not changing your chromosomes they're not changing your dna it doesn't matter what it looks like when you unbutton your pants you are either a man or you are a woman so forget about being gay lesbian transsexual pansexual intersexual asexual transgendered whatever the hell you want to call yourself <laughs> yeah exactly just whatever you want to call yourself it doesn't matter it's elective surgery you are not entitled to it you are not entitled to have taxpayers pay for it. You do the same thing. My friend in the military wanted a nose job so bad, so bad that he paid to have it done. He took three weeks of his earned leave and he took his savings and he went and had a nose job done. why because the military won't do it just because you want it they do surgery to fix you if you break while performing military functions or they'll do surgery on you to make you better to perform military functions okay when you're confused about whether you're a boy or a girl or a man or a woman or whether you're a donkey or a man or a goat or a woman it, I mean I don't care whether you're confused or not those are grounds for a discharge okay uh, due to mental defect so get this through your head it's not about hating transgender people it's not this president has been the most open president in history about supporting 
the LGBTQIAP community's rights. You can tell me I'm full of crap all you want to, but you can't prove otherwise. This is about resources. I had to smack down a writer from GQ earlier today who said, oh, well, it's only costing as much as four of Trump's seven trips to Mar-a-Lago that he's already taken. It doesn't matter. It absolutely doesn't matter what the cost is. If we're not doing elective procedures for soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines, then we're not doing them for any of them. It doesn't matter what they identify as sexually. Let's take the money and put it towards the veterans the veterans that are coming back with legs blown off or arms blown off or severe head traumas and put the money towards treating them, they're the ones that are truly in need and they're owed. They're making those gigantic sacrifices that people out there can't even fathom. Oh, they claim, oh, well, you know, they volunteered for that. Yeah, they did volunteer for that. That's what makes it so great. That's what makes our military so great. And it doesn't matter if they are transgendered or not, or if they are gay or lesbian or transsexual. It doesn't matter if they go in the battlefield and are wounded. They are making a sacrifice that 99.5% of you will never be able to understand. Those are the people that the money should be being spent on. I've had it up to my eyeballs with this friggin' liberal narrative that keeps getting twisted and pushed. And every time somebody spits on the road, it takes a little twist around it. And they got to turn it back the other way to try to make it work. I'm sick of it. And now that I got that off my chest, we can move on to the prepared portion of the program. So the first, the first bit of prepared business that I want to take care of is I would like to congratulate the island nation of Japan. Yeah, I know you're saying, what Japan? What did they do? Yeah, nothing you would have heard about in the news really, but on July 17th, the fourth annual March for Life in Japan took place in Tokyo. This is a country where it's estimated that 38 and a half million babies have been murdered by abortion since 1949. Now, according to Daily Nightly, Japan's March for Life was organized by a private restaurant owner, Masaki Ikeda, the march itself lasted one hour, beginning at 4 p.m., following a mass at the Tsukiji Catholic Church. The march route went from the church to Hibiya Park while passing Ginza and Niombashi along the way. And forgive my Japanese because it's worse than my Chinese, which is atrocious. Uh, I'll, I'll get to Far East languages at a later date. I'm working on Middle East languages right now. Um, the first ever March for Life in Japan four years ago consisted of only 33 people. 33. Okay. Um, the 2017 March managed to assemble 150 people. So they are growing slowly, but they are growing. Uh, during the march, participants prayed, sang hymns, and carried a statue of the Blessed Mother with them. This year, the march included not only Japanese citizens, but also some foreigners living in Japan uh, from the United States, Ireland, and France, to name a few of the countries, according to Daily Nightly. 
that's the name of their paper over there, Daily Nightly, in case you weren't catching that. Um, they have some quirky things over there, and that's just one of them. Uh, among the marchers uh, were a city council member from Kishawa and three priests from Tokyo and Yokohama. The marchers were mostly, mostly Catholic, uh, but other groups did attend. A representative of a pro-life multi-denominational church group from Taiwan came to the march in Tokyo. Uh, also mentioned uh, was that there was great interest from other Christian and even Buddhist groups to take part in future marches. The, uh, the support for the pro-life movement is low, but it is growing in Japan. And the March for Life has been organized by Masaki Ikeda since it began in 2014, although the Archdiocese of Tokyo released an announcement for the 2017 March of Life, the Japanese Catholic bishops have not shown support for the movement officially as of yet. Uh, the paper also reported that the march uh, had a flyer made for the first time, which was funded by a private donation. Uh, they also said that the Japanese government is becoming more pro-life due to the decreasing population of the country. Uh, and this support apparently was more for economic reasons, but still showing support for life. You know, we'll take it. Uh, according to the publication, abortion became legal in Japan in 1948 when the government adopted the Eugenic Protection Law. In 1949, an amendment to this law allowed abortion for quote-unquote economic reasons. Uh, between then and 2015, 38 and a half million babies have been aborted in Japan. Uh, Lila Rose, the founder of Live Action in the United States, said we need to build the culture of life all over the world. Um, in a video posted on ProLife.jp, uh, and yeah, the video was posted on ProLife.jp, uh, in Japan especially because of the legacy you have to build the culture of life in Japan and fighting for the right to life for all people, including the smallest Japanese. So, uh, you know, God bless you, Japan, and especially um, uh, Masaki Ikeda, who's organizing all this over there. Uh, God bless you and, and keep up the fight. So, you know, I hate leaving good news for bad, <clears throat> but Unfortunately, this is the news cycle. Um, so we move on to some, eh, you know, I mean, it's it's bad news in a whole, but whatever. Here we go. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro, you know Maduro. He took over when Hugo Chavez died, uh, and he went even harder socialism than Chavez was doing. Chavez was taking the country on a slow road. Uh, Maduro just put his foot on the gas pedal and said, let's go. So anyway, uh, Maduro, uh, according to Venezuelan sources, yeah, I know, Venezuelan sources, at least that's better than just sources, right? Anyway, he is actively considering uh, taking asylum in either Russia or Cuba as international pressure grows on his embattled regime and the country's political crisis worsens. Uh, Texas-based uh, Stratford say its analysts have received persistent reports over the past year that Maduro has been considered, uh, has considered asking for refuge in China or, or, I'm sorry, in Russia or Cuba. Excuse me. Uh, Cuba is playing a key role in indirect talks between Russia and the United States on Venezuela, the consultancy said in a recently released report. Uh, the Russian or Cuban governments would be willing to accept the president and his wife, uh, Celia Flores, but not other political figures, according to the report. 
Cuban officials were also involved with Spain in months of negotiations that resulted in a decision by Maduro to release opposition uh, Leopoldo Lopez uh, from prison. He's the opposition leader earlier this month. Uh, they were hoping that would quell the people in the country. It apparently has not. Uh, but the release of Lopez was an apparent concession to the United States. Uh, Maduro is facing intensifying pressure from the administration of President Trump, who this week called for the Venezuelan president, or who this week called the Venezuelan president a bad leader who dreams of becoming a dictator. I think he's a bad dictator who's dreaming of being a leader. I think that would be more accurate. But anyway, um, you know, with, with President Trump, you get what you get. You don't have to like it. It just is what it is. Uh, Trump threatened swift economic sanctions if Maduro moves forward with plans to form a constituent assembly on July 30th. Uh, the United States once again calls for free and fair elections and stands with the people of Venezuela in their quest to restore their country to a full and prosperous democracy, said President Trump. Maduro's push to form a constituent assembly rejected by a majority of some 7.1 million voters in a non-binding referendum held last Sunday would disrupt the constitutional order in Venezuela. According to Moises Rendon, associate director of the Americas program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. And that's a mouthful. Uh, this new hand-picked assembly will claim it has the power to change and select new institutions and authorities, implement different private property laws, and rewrite the Constitution, he wrote in a column that appeared this week on the center's website. Uh, Venezuela is rapidly becoming a failed state, according to the report. The institutions are not functioning. The police, the judiciary, uh, judiciary, uh, the health sector are all in shambles. Uh, you know, it would, this poses a significant security risk for the United States because Maduro's government uh, and the military are deeply involved in drug trafficking and other illegal activities. And yes, the military is behind Maduro. The people are not. In February, the Treasury Department named Maduro's executive vice president, uh, Tarek al-Assami, uh, as a, quote, specially designated narcotics trafficker. That's classy for an executive vice president in a nation's administration. El-Assami's associate, uh, Lopez Bello, was also designated for providing material assistance, financial support or goods or services in support of the international narcotics trafficking activities and acting for or on behalf of El Asami. So he's got that going for him. Uh, the vice president has also been accused, the vice president of Venezuela, that is, not the United States. The vice president has also been accused of running an illegal immigration scheme while head of Venezuela's National Office of Identification, in which he issued identity and travel documents to suspicious Arab and Iranian operatives. Uh, according to the report released this month by the American Enterprise Institute, the same report said elements of Venezuela's government directly manage and support drug trafficking, money laundering, terrorism financing, support for guerrilla movements, and international corruption. Maybe it was Venezuelan collusion, huh? Maybe, maybe Congress better start looking into that. According to one of the report's authors, visiting fellow Roger Noriega, Noriega, yeah, uh, officials within Maduro's administration and the military involved in drug trafficking are pushing 20 years evading accountability. <clears throat> the U.S. judicial system is the only thing that most of these people fear, Noriega said. 
Uh, many would prefer to negotiate deals with U.S. law enforcement to avoid prosecution, what you think, uh, for international drug crimes rather than be left exposed if the Maduro regime loses power. Uh, there are very important figures in the government's security apparatus who have decided to cooperate with the United States investigators in order to protect themselves. So we've already got intelligence coming in from these insiders. Um, according to the State Department's 2017 International Narcotics Control Strategy Report, Venezuela is one of the preferred trafficking routes for illegal drugs, predominantly cocaine from South America to the Caribbean region, Central America, the United States, Western Africa, and Europe. Because it's so close, right? The U.S. has indicated a former National Guard commander, General Nestor Luis uh, Rivera Torres, and Edalberto Jose Molina, former assistant director of the country's anti-drugs office, for conspiracy to traffic internationally and cocaine. Wow. So there you have it. Uh, Venezuela is still a huge dumpster fire. Um, luckily, luckily, that doesn't really affect us economically all that much, uh, other than the fact that they are an oil exporter. So it could have a little bit to do with the price of oil. I don't know about anybody else, but that price jumped uh, eight cents a gallon on gasoline here today uh, where I live. Uh, I don't know if anybody else noted that today, but whatever, you know, it is what it is. Now, <clears throat> we're going to, uh, you know, we're at the end of that story. I don't want to, I don't want to start this and have to go to commercial and then come back and finish it. Can I finish it quick? No, because I need it. We need this. Um, we're going we're gonna to go ahead, and I know I'm going to catch uh, Rick off guard here for a minute, but I'll, I'll, I'll stall and give him a second to get everything queued up. We're going to go ahead and take the commercial break here in just a second. Um, when we come back, very sad story this week. We're going to discuss the Charlie Guard situation. Uh, this heartbreaking story out of England and these poor parents who basically had their child stolen from them by the government just so he could basically be condemned to death. So do yourself a favor, go get something from the fridge to drink. Cause that's what I'm going to do and get yourself back here in about three to four minutes and we'll carry on. We'll knock out the second half of the show and all that good stuff. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. All writers are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from the critique of the short story through to line edits on full-length novels. We also offer assistance on generating writer's bios for your websites. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you in your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not the government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty HealthShare. Liberty HealthShare is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty HealthShare is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. 
Stop letting others tell you what to do and join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty HealthShare and take back the control of your health care while helping those around you. Call Liberty at 855-58-LIBERTY. Again, that's 855-58-L-I-B-E-R-T-Y for more information. Or you can check them out at libertyhealthshare.org. Again, that's libertyhealthshare.org. The following message contains a special offer for listeners of this station. Are you a man over 40? Are you constantly looking for the nearest bathroom? Do you wake up multiple times a night to use the bathroom? Right now, Perfect Prostate is sending out free bottles of their groundbreaking new formula to listeners of this station. Perfect Prostate formula was developed by medical doctor Mitchell Fleischer, and its ingredients have been clinically studied to reduce your frequent nighttime bathroom visits and promote healthy urine flow. Right now, preferred customers get their first bottle of Perfect Prostate absolutely free. There's nothing to lose. Perfect Prostate is guaranteed to reduce that constant urge to use the bathroom, especially at night, and promote healthy urine flow. Don't wait. Call now for your free bottle. Just pay shipping and processing. Dial 1-800-675-0251. That's 1-800-675-0251. Supplies are limited. One free bottle per household. Call now. Dial 1-800-675-0251. That's 1-800-675-0251. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can find the weekend Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call All right, get welcome 40 back. Viagra pills for only yeah, $99. Pretty this good, can right cost as minutes. much as $600 okay. at your local pharmacy. You so, can afford uh, not to call us. If you want get Viagra rolling, at I just the want lowest to do a prices, programming never pay $15. That- Coming up next pharmacy after prices me again. will be Get Jesse's Viagra POV, less than followed by a very bill. special Stafford voice making a Wednesday night appearance. Today and save up and to five hundred dollars and off the rails and with forty pills for just ninety nine dollars. Healthy so men are fast, favor. easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at one eight hundred five one six seventy six zero two to take your now. call right now. Call one eight hundred five one six seventy six zero two. That's one eight hundred five one six seventy six zero two. Again, one eight hundred five one six seventy six zero two. 7602 have ended Every their legal day, challenge to take him to the United States for United experimental States treatment. Marine Corps stand ready A lawyer representing Chris Garvey, Connie Yates, told the High Court that time had run out the proud, the for Charlie. Hey folks, I want to Chris introduce Gard you to said, of Dr. Richard Harden. We are on the same mission. It meant that his sweet, gorgeous, America. innocent little boy paths. would not so reach his first birthday on August 4th. Keep up with Richard and all his work. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about uh, Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his A whole books. lot of time has been wasted, she added. We're sorry we could not save you. Their lawyer, Grant Armstrong, said the parents' worst fears had been confirmed. Uh, the judge told uh, Mr. Justice Francis, U.S. neurologist Dr. Michio Hirano, had said that he was no longer willing to offer the baby experimental therapy after he saw the results of a new MRI just this past week. He added that Mr. Guards and Miss Yates in Bedfont, West London, now hope to establish a foundation to ensure Charlie's voice continues to be heard. In a statement outside the court, Mr. Guards said that Charlie was an absolute warrior and they could not be prouder of him. Charlie has had a greater impact on and touched more people in this world in his 11 months than many people do in a lifetime. We could not have more love and pride for our beautiful boy. We are now going to spend our last precious moments with our son, Charlie, 
who unfortunately won't make it to his first birthday in just under two weeks' time. The family had raised 1.3 million pounds in donations to take their son abroad for the experimental treatment. Uh, this is just so hard. It just, you just don't know how mad I am about this. The hospital challenged the parents' rights to treat their son elsewhere. And the damned courts upheld the hospital's claim. All these legal challenges going on, they could have started by bringing the doctor over in the first place. The hospital, not the parents. It's not their fault. They fought. They did all they could do within the confines of the law. And I'm telling you now, had that been my son, I'd be in jail. There's no way around it because I would have flat just dropped somebody that told me I couldn't take care of my son to the best of my ability. It's not like they were asking the government to do anything for them. They had the money. Charlie has encephalomyopathic mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome. And if you think you can say that three times fast, you're better than me. He has brain damage and cannot move his arms or legs. Kelly Gollop, the lawyer representing the Great Ormond Street Hospital, where Charlie has been treated since October, said doctors disagreed with the parents who believed MRI scans in January had shown that treatment could have been affected. All aspects of the clinical picture and all of Charlie's observations indicated that his brain was irreversibly damaged and that the therapy was futile, she said. The hospital paid tribute to the bravery of the decision made by Charlie's parents. In a statement, it said over the weekend, they communicated their desire to spend all the time they can with Charlie whilst working with the hospital to formulate the best possible plan for the end of his life care. The agony, desolation, and bravery of their decision command the utmost respect and humble all who work at this hospital. Mr. Justice Francis paid tribute to Charlie's parents and said no one could comprehend their agony and no parents could have done more. In his judgment, the judge said last week's MRI scan had shown Charlie had no muscle at all on parts of his body and was beyond help. He said Mr. Guards and Ms. Yates were now prepared to accept Charlie should be moved to palliative care and be allowed to die with dignity. The judge also decried the, the quote, absurd notion which had appeared in recent days that Charlie had been a prisoner of the National Health Service, calling it the antithesis of the truth. No, sir, you are wrong. He said that in this country, children have rights independent of their parents. They do here too, sir. They do here too. He has a right to life. It's the most basic human right. Occasionally there were circumstances when a hospital and the parents were unable to agree on what course of action was in the best interest of the child patient. In that instance, the decision is referred to an independent judge, he continued. Outside court, Charlie's army campaigners reacted angrily and chanted, shame on you, judge, and shame on gosh, which is the greater Ormond Street Hospital. Falling to the ground, one female supporter said, he had a chance and you took it away. 
and I can't agree more. I, for the life of me, I do not understand why this hospital was so resistant to trying the experimental care. Why would, it's not like this treatment hasn't been discussed publicly before. There's an eight-year-old boy in this country who underwent the treatment as a baby. He's now eight. Eight. You don't get to dictate what quality of life means to him. Life itself is precious. And it's worth fighting for. This just, you just don't know how mad this makes me. So angry. So angry that they didn't even try. That's, that's what really pisses me off the most. If they had brought the doctor that's so familiar with this treatment over and they tried it with Charlie, or at least took the scans and let this doctor read it from the beginning. Doctor, we have a case. We think you might be able to help. It's not like they don't read the medical journals. This stuff is out there. They know the treatment exists. They knew it existed already. They never called them. They wait until after the freaking court battle, basically. And then they're going to say that they're going to let him die with dignity? What's dignified about having a damn judge in a black robe say you can't have care that might have saved your life? Just sit over here and die while we unplug the machine that keeps you alive. What's dignified in that? Burns my ass. All right. We're going to shift gears. <sighs> Catch my breath here. The Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court ruled on this Monday. Uh, let's see, today's Wednesday. So that'd be the 24th of July. That undocumented immigrants cannot be held by law enforcement on an immigration and customs enforcement detainer alone. Massachusetts law provides no authority for Massachusetts court officers to arrest and hold an individual solely on the basis of a federal civil immigration detainer beyond the time that the individual would otherwise be entitled to be released from state custody, the court wrote. Interesting. Interesting indeed. So the case review centered around uh, Seyun Nun Lun, who came to the United States as a refugee from Cambodia in 1985. Uh, but he was ordered deported back to the country in 2008 after criminal convictions. Lund was arraigned in Boston Municipal Court uh, on October 24, 2016, on a single count of unarmed robbery. Uh, the day before the arraignment, the United States Department of Homeland Security issued a civil immigration detainer against him. Now think about this. This is Obama's homeland security. Issued a detainer against him. The detainer document was a standard form document then in use by the department. It requested, among other things, that the Massachusetts authorities continue to hold Lund in state custody for up to two days after he would otherwise be released in order to give federal officers of the department time to arrive and take him into federal custody. Lund was held under the ICE detainer for more than three months as officials tried to have him deported. But because he was born in a Thai refugee camp to Cambodian parents, 
neither country recognizes his citizenship and will not accept him. This court decision sets an important precedent that we are a country that upholds the Constitution and the rule of law, Carol Rose of the American Civil Liberties Union said. At a time when the Trump administration is pushing aggressive and discriminatory immigration enforcement policies, Massachusetts is leading the way nationwide by limiting how states and local enforcement assist. Well, let me tell you something. She can call this administration's actions discriminatory, but it's not unless you're calling it discriminatory against criminals. There's no right for a foreigner to come to the United States. None. Zero. It doesn't exist. If we have the right to accept and refuse people, we have the right to ship them out. if they're here illegally, that is. Now, what's going to be interesting is to see how the federal government reacts now that Attorney General Sessions has begun to yank the purse strings back on all these federal grants uh, that sanctuary cities used to get. He's, he's already started. He's starting to reduce money to squeeze these cities to force them to cooperate. Now, basically, what Massachusetts is saying is we're not going to cooperate, not Boston, not Worcester, not Marlboro, not Boxboro, the whole damn state saying they're not gonna cooperate. And not only are they not going to cooperate, they're telling their law enforcement, you can't cooperate with the federal government. So some interesting times ahead uh, with Massachusetts and the federal government uh, to see what's going to happen with this. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know how you solve this problem. I, you know, I don't know all the ins and outs of the immigration system. We've been here before on this show. Um, you know, I, I have lots to learn still, but uh, one thing I do know, I would look for uh, federal dollars flowing to the state of Massachusetts to be reduced drastically in the very near future. Uh, I would expect the same is going to happen in like California and Illinois, um, but that's just what it is. Now, sanctuary cities... Uh, you know, increase incidence of crime by harboring illegal immigrants. And uh, the worst offenders, of course, uh, are Chicago, New York City, San Francisco, Philadelphia, uh, according to Immigrations and Customs, anyway. Uh, sanctuary cities, uh, according to our um, uh, ICE director, uh, Holman, What's his name? Holman. Holman. What, what is Holman's name? Um, Thomas Holman. Uh, you know, uh, is Chicago doing everything that it can to decrease the criminal activity there? Holman says, no, I don't think so. Uh, if you're an illegal alien and you get arrested in the United States for a crime and you get booked in Cook County, Chicago, uh, my officers aren't allowed in the jail said the ICE director. They don't even let the federal ICE employees into the jail. How's that for cooperation for you, huh? Uh, New York City, the site of the most horrific terrorist event in this nation's history, and they don't accept ICE detainers. New York City, they're proud of being a sanctuary city after 9-11, after the terrorist attacks on police officers with hatchets. San Francisco, how soon they forget, Holman said. 
referring to the 2015 of Catherine Steinle by an illegal immigrant. Sanctuary cities have policies that limit local police from cooperating with federal immigration agents. And this criticism is directed at politicians, not local police or sheriffs in these sanctuary cities. The street cops, they want to help. It's the politicians who want to make this a political game. It's not a political game. And people, if you're in a sanctuary city, this is a matter of life and death, public safety. And for them to be playing politics with this, it's, it borders on criminal. It really does. Uh, Holman said more resources are in the works uh, to take on targets in those cities. Uh, he said, in the America I grew up in, cities didn't shield people who violated the law. Boom, and there you have it, just like that. So, yeah, we do have a problem with illegal immigration in this country, and it's a problem that needs to be fixed. And we don't need the trend horn. That's what we don't need. So I'm going to shut that down. Um, and uh, we'll get this thing figured out. But, uh, you know, that's, that's just, you know, like he was talking about Cook County, but, you know, this is – Cook County is just a symptom of the problem. You got it all over the country, but here we're going to – we're next story up. We're going to cue right back into Illinois again because this all stems from Chicago politics to Illinois politics. It's, you know, it's a cesspool. And you, you may or may not have read this in national news stories, but Illinois is continuing to go through one of the worst state budgetary crises in history. The financial mismanagement is so bad, it's taken the state over three years to pass a budget. Three years. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, it was years before Obama passed a budget, too. Despite a looming junk status credit rating that is just dangling in front of their nose, uh, they have pension plans not being paid out, hundreds of state employees being laid off, uh, lawmakers have made it a 2017 legislative priority to increase abortion funding. Are you kidding me? House Bill 40, if signed by Governor Rauner, will allow Medicaid coverage of elective abortions and give state employees access to abortions under the state's health insurance plans. With what money, you may ask? Well, if you don't, I'm going to tell you anyway. In all likelihood, it will just add to the already overwhelming debt burden on Illinois taxpayers. Illinois is already carrying $266 billion, that's billion with a B, in unfunded liabilities for its state's pension plan, and another $15 billion on top of that in other unpaid debt. Now, one thing is certain, one thing, the left is intent on ensuring abortion remains funded no matter what funding crisis may be at hand. Other states are taking similar steps to protect Planned Parenthood's resources in advance of the Republican health care bill. For example, the governor of Oregon, we covered this story, has pledged to sign what will be the most intrusive health insurance coverage law in the United States, HB 3391, which has already passed the legislature, requires insurance companies to provide at no cost for any person, citizen or not, the following, contraceptives without a prescription, vasectomies, abortions, and gender identity related health services. And the abortions are allowed through the ninth month. Christian business owners in Oregon will be forced to cover sex reassignment surgeries and abortions for their employees. And because insurance companies would be forced to spread the cost of these quote unquote free services over all insured, the reality is that every Oregonian will pay for them. 
The good news is that many more states in the last few years have taken action to dramatically cut funding to Planned Parenthood and other abortion businesses. It's evidence of something we say often at the Family Policy Alliance, elections matter. And I wish we had a few extra minutes, but we do not have time for this last story, which is a shame because it's a good one. I will save it for next time. Um, we're, we're probably about two minutes before the end of the program here tonight. I want to remind you that Jesse's POV is coming up next, followed by Daniel Stafford with the Stafford Voice, and then America Off the Rails with Rowdy Rick Robinson. Do yourself the favor. Stay right here with KLRN Radio all night. Get your knowledge on. It's the thing to do. And what I can promise you is that you're going to be given great topics to ponder. I mean, you know, Sometimes I muddle through and, and, you know, there's there's some ring rust coming back after a couple weeks off, but I'll get it back together. Don't worry. Um, what I uh, what I also want to do is I want to uh, what is it I wanted to do? I don't, boy, it's tough getting old. Tell you what. Uh, I want to thank you for being here. I know that. Um, it's a. Uh, it's a privilege to do this week in and week out. And uh, wow, to, to think that we're actually on the way to show number 200. We've passed 100. That was weeks ago. Uh, we're actually on our way to 200 now. Um, it's, it's special. And without you, it means nothing. So thank you so much. Uh, if you like the show, tell your friends. If your friends like the show, you probably need some new ones. But they and you are welcome here every week with me on KLRN Radio for the Conservative Curmudgeon Show. Thank you for tuning in. Peace out. God bless. The following message. Wrong button. One second. That's okay. You're allowed. Something to see, baby.